It's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Ahoyerno, who says, Someone offers you a million euros to produce ten anti-feminist videos with the length and quality of five things, but without your name, nothing recognizable. Someone else will do the voice acting. You only have to produce the scripts and post-editing and deny everything. Will you do it? Are your principles for sale? A million euros would be nice. I haven't done the conversion as to how many dollars that would be, but I'm pretty sure it would be a nice little nest egg. But I don't think I would do that. I don't know, and I, I don't mean to sound like, you know, I'm above reproach and my, my principles are not for sale. I just don't think I would be capable of that. I just don't think... Because to me, anti-feminism, uh, that kind of willful, ingrained, like toxic sexism is no different to me than racism or, uh, you know, anti-gay bigotry or anti-trans bigotry or uh, bigotry against a particular religious group. Like, bigotry is bigotry, and I don't think I would be capable of making videos uh, that promoted bigotry. I could never produce a video or help to produce a video that was uh, diametrically opposed to my beliefs and and was dedicated to putting something out into the world, into the ether of the internet that I consider to be uh, extremely, extremely harmful as I consider anti-feminism to be. So no, I, uh, short answer to follow that long rambling answer, uh, no, I wouldn't do it. Matt Helmers, hey yo Steve. I recently learned about other kin, people who believe that they are spiritually or psychologically an animal other than human. An offshoot of this community call themselves fiction kin. These are people who identify as a fictional character at their core. So somebody could be Superman kin and believe he was Superman in a past life or currently is Superman in another universe. Clearly these are people harmlessly exploring their identity. There's nothing wrong with that. However, let's imagine another offshoot called non-fiction kin. These would be people who identify spiritually as an actual person. Someone who identifies as Chris Hemsworth kin would claim to spiritually be Chris Hemsworth. Someone who is Steve Shives kin would claim to be Steve Shives at their core. Would you consider such a self-identity to be harmless, or would you consider it a violation of the actual person's identity? I would consider it harmless, as long as the person who identified as uh, Steve Shives' kin uh, did not feel that that feeling of identification entitled them to anything, or enabled them to take any liberties with me or my actual identity, you know, as long as they didn't feel entitled to start doing things in my name or uh, exploiting parts of, of me and my identity. I, I, what do I care? You know, uh, I, I agree with what you say in, earlier in your question. I, it seems harmless to me. I mean, I understand a lot of people finding it odd, um, and I understand some people uh, finding it offensive if, if you try to place other kin on the same level as something like like uh, like sexuality or gender identity which is very firmly deeply rooted in who you are um, and is something that as far as we can tell traces back to the earliest days of humanity something that has been with us for as long as as we have been here as this species whereas something like other kin is more like a subculture and it's a subculture that some people identify very very strongly with and i don't think that that uh, should be disparaged or, or disrespected, but there's there's a difference between identifying very strongly with a particular subculture and uh, being a member of a group that has been socially marginalized because of some enduring uh, immutable trait that they have, like their sexuality or their gender identity or their color or their uh, gender or whatever. Um, so I think it's, a, it's fine to sort of draw those distinctions, but I don't think that people who identify as other kin or identify with a particular subculture that many of us from outside that subculture would find odd or difficult to understand or, or, or what have you. I don't think they deserve to be ridiculed or disparaged or harassed or uh, bullied because of that. I, I think as long as they're doing no harm, they deserve to be allowed to live their lives however they want. And it does, it does no harm to any of us to accept them and tolerate them and treat them as they would like to be treated. 
Um, so as long as someone wasn't doing any doing doing me or anyone else that they identified with any harm, wasn't trying to impersonate me or, or take my place or uh, you know infringe on my rights and my identity, I would have no problem with someone uh, identifying as Steve Shives' kin or something like that. I, I I can't imagine why it would be a problem for me. Becca Hawkins. I've been thinking about the term politically correct. It strikes me as odd whenever people talk about political correctness. I tend to think that the term PC is usually used to refer to progressive politics or politics leaning toward inclusion of the marginalized. But the term itself, politically correct, isn't denoting any specific kind of politics. I always want to ask the people who whine about SJWs and political correctness what would be correct politics for a Fox News employee to have, for example. But then I think to myself, why bother? In most cases, it feels like there's no hope for any real dialogue. Am I being too cynical here? I don't think you're being too cynical. I think you're right. There are people who it would probably be a waste of time to try and have these sorts of discussions with people who are just closed off to the discussion and aren't interested in talking about it or considering another perspective. I don't think you're being cynical. I think you're probably just being realistic about that. Um, but I think you've also hit on a, uh, a really fundamental truth about this concept of political correctness is that you're right. Usually people who complain about political correctness are applying that term and have defined that term to mean politics of inclusion, social consciousness, you know, sensitivity to others and other people's experiences and other people's backgrounds. Um, and they view that and they, and they view that with a very disparaging, uh, point of view, but you're right. You know, there are, uh, Conservatives are people who are normally disdainful of political correctness and social justice advocacy and social consciousness who practice their own form of political correctness. There are expressions and, and thoughts and ideas and behaviors that are considered unacceptable in those circles, just as there would be those sorts of behaviors that are considered unacceptable in what they would call PC circles. Um, it just depends on what you define as acceptable and what you define as unacceptable. And I think the same thing could be true uh, not just of the concept of political correctness, but of other concepts that are uh, associated with uh, progressive politics or socially conscious people, social justice advocates. Things like trigger warnings or, you know, being sensitive to being aware of people who uh, want to be addressed by pronouns, uh, that they prefer, you know, that you, you might not assume, you might assume by looking at someone that they are a man and prefer to be addressed as he or him, but in fact they prefer to be addressed as she or her. Um, and, you know, uh, there's, there was a, a meme going around on Facebook recently that I saw where someone pointed out uh, how hypocritical it is for some people to have a problem with that. There are some folks who are maybe very socially conservative who sort of sneer at the idea of referring to a person by their preferred pronouns rather than the pronoun that 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 uh, you think they should have. Where you know, if you judge a person to be a man, then you insist on calling him a him uh, and a he rather than a she or a her. And it doesn't matter what what the person thinks; it only matters what you thinks, what you think. And the meme says, okay, to anyone who who rejects the idea of you know the importance of referring to a person by their preferred pronoun. Just see what their reaction is when you start referring to, to uh, God as a she. Um, because for most Christians and uh, Muslims and Jewish folks, you know, they, the concept of God is masculine and God is referred to very insistently as a he. He and him are God's preferred pronouns. And if you start referring to God as she or her, some folks uh, can get pretty bent out of shape about that. So in that sense, they very much understand the importance of respecting preferred pronouns. It's just in other cases, they make fun of it and think it's this frivolous, ridiculous thing. Um, so yeah, I think you've really hit on something there, Becca. I think it's, it's very much a matter of perspective and a matter of point of view. And people who insist that they reject all of these, uh, you know, SJW concepts and they consider it to be anti-freedom of speech and it's just so oppressive, uh, they actually embrace those concepts in their own lives from their own perspectives. They just don't call them the same things as they call them when they are applying them negatively to other people. Sizzmaster6985. Hey Steve, 
You've said you think Superman Returns is a very underrated film, and I was wondering what other superhero comic book films you consider to be underrated or disagree with the critical general consensus on. In my own opinion, it's Ang Lee's Hulk film from 2003, which I found superior to the dumb reboot action film from 2008, and Blade II. I'm right there with you on Ang Lee's Hulk. I have been a cheerleader for that film since I first saw it, um, and I think it is a beautiful film. I, I don't like it quite as much as I like Superman Returns. I think Superman Returns for me is sort of my, uh, my gold standard for a superhero film. But I think Ang Lee's Hulk is wonderful. I think it's, it's a beautiful, poetic film. I think the performances are great. I love the direction. I love the visuals. I think it's just a really, really well done movie. I love uh, bringing in the idea of the Hulk as sort of a metaphor for surviving child abuse, um, which is something that, that originates in the comic books. I think it was Peter David who first uh, brought that into the comic book, sort of linking Bruce Banner's anger to having an abused childhood. And there's a version of that incorporated into Ang Lee's Hulk film. And I just really, really enjoyed that. I, th I thought some of the scenes between Bruce Banner and his father were incredibly powerful and really just loaded with meaning. And um, I, I think it's a, a really, really underrated, wonderful film. And I think it is, it's one of the best superhero films I've ever seen. Another one that I might bring up um, that I think is not necessarily a, a great movie or even a good movie, but one that I think is unfairly maligned is Spider-Man 3. Uh, I don't think Spider-Man 3 is as good as the previous two films in its franchise. I think Sam Raimi's first two Spider-Man films are both excellent. I think Spider-Man 2 is right up there with Superman Returns and Hulk for me in terms of how good it is. Uh, but uh, I think Spider-Man 3 is not nearly as bad as some people think it is. It is too long. It does have too many characters. It does feel like they really just wedged Venom in there because they wanted to do Venom in a Spider-Man movie. And this, the, movie, the, the movie's heart doesn't really belong to Venom. The movie's heart clearly is with Sandman. And they it really want Sandman to be the villain, you know, and Venom is just sort of stuck in there. Um, but the parts of Spider-Man 3 that work uh, really, really work for me. Yes, it feels really forced, the stuff with uh, Peter and, and Harry and how Harry gets injured with the, the pumpkin bomb. And then a couple days later, it's like he's fine. He just has some scars. You know, there's no recovery time. Like, there, are, there are things, there are weaknesses narratively to the film for sure. But when it hits those big emotional beats, like when, uh, when Peter and Harry reconcile after having lost their friendship and they, they come back together just in time, you know? And then that beautiful scene when Peter forgives the Sandman for what the Sandman did to him. Um, such a sincere and heartfelt scene. I know that uh, a lot of people make fun of this movie for, you know, the scenes of Peter Parker crying and, and how it sort of wears its heart on its sleeve, but I really like those. I, I think those that, that sense of, of uh, emotional vulnerability and that sincerity that not only we get from Peter and, and Tobey Maguire's performance, but from Sam Raimi, the filmmaker, to show us these, these raw emotional moments and not treat them ironically, not treat them as you know, a subject for a laugh, but to really show us this beautiful moment of the hero forgiving the villain who harmed him so egregiously. Um, I think it's really, really good stuff. I really, really like a lot of what is going on in Spider-Man 3. Uh, so I would add that to the list as well, although I would not place it in the same category as, as a movie like uh, Ang Lee's Hulk. The BT. Hi, Steve. I wanted to know your thoughts on the differences of language use when it comes to words that are seen as bigoted in one country but not in another. For example, in America, spaz or spastic has no impact and generally seems to be applied at someone who is a bit hyperactive, Though in the UK, it's incredibly ableist after a cerebral palsy charity was called the Spastic Society and the word was turned into a slur. A mistake that Nintendo ran foul of when a Mario Party game was released with the word. Conversely, the C word, while seen as vulgar and deliberately offensive here in the UK, does not have the misogynistic roots it has in the US. The reason why this is an issue is that the dominant culture tends to dictate the rules and many Brits run into accusations of misogyny if they use the word online. Part of me thinks most people I interact with online will be American, and it's a term that many associate with misogyny, so I won't use it. 
But then there's a part of me thinking, stuff the American cultural dominance of the internet. I want to keep the word that is used to describe someone who has done something morally reprehensible. This was inspired because of Ricky Gervais promoting an animal rights message today and was called out on it, and my reaction to 50 Cent bullying an autistic child at the airport, causing me to use the word. Well, generally speaking, I think it's most fair to judge a person and their, uh, their use of language by the standards of their culture. Now, there are exceptions to that. Like, as you said um, in your question, if you are speaking to a person who you know comes from a culture where a given word is considered extremely offensive, I think at that point, if you have that knowledge, it's probably more on you to avoid using a word that you know will offend them, unless it's your intention to offend them. Um, but for the most part, I think we have to try and uh, give people the benefit of the doubt and judge people according to the standards of their culture. There will certainly be times when you inadvertently step on someone's toes. I don't think that's as important as how you react and how you respond when that happens. You know, there have certainly been times when I have uh, inadvertently offended somebody, when I've said something that to them sounded very hurtful and very offensive, but to me, I didn't think anything about it. I thought it was fine. And I think in those situations, when that, when that kind of thing happens, and when it's brought to your attention, you know, when someone says to you that something you've said has, has hurt them or offended them, I think you have to accept it like an adult, you know. I think that's more important than, than trying to avoid those situations. I mean, I think you should avoid them if you can, but you're never going to be able to avoid it entirely because you just don't, you can't possibly know all the time that what you're saying is going to be offensive to someone. But when that happens and when you're made aware of it, I think you need to respond in a grown-up way and say, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you would interpret it that way. I didn't mean to offend you. I won't use that word around you or I won't say that, whatever I said, around you uh, anymore because I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or alienate you. I think that's the best way to respond. And I think our response when we do accidentally say something that is offensive to someone but isn't offensive to us uh, is more important than, uh, you know, avoiding it in the first place. Because you, there are, there are going to be times when it's going to happen. When you talk to people from different cultures, from different parts of the world, you're going to say things without meaning to be offensive that, uh, that will be offensive to people. And uh, the most important thing is how you handle it. Like how I handle this. I constantly have to create some sort of bridge from, from this segment into the next segment. And how I have chosen to handle it for the most part is just to not do that. That's probably not the best way to handle it. It would be better to come up with like a nice smooth transition from this to that, but I just haven't done it. So don't follow my example. Be better. Do better than I did. Because now I'm just stuck here saying it's time for the lightning round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. Patrick Dodds, Steve, do you like any of the works of Mike Judge? I can't imagine you picking Beavis and Butthead, but maybe King of the Hill or Office Space? I actually like all three of those. I like Beavis and Butthead. I think Beavis and Butthead is funny. Uh, I don't think it's like a masterpiece or, you know, the greatest thing ever, but I, I like Beavis and Butthead a lot. And I really like King of the Hill. I was a fan of King of the Hill for a long time, and I think Office Space is hilarious. So I am actually quite a fan of the works of Mike Judge uh, altogether, and I like all three of those works that you mentioned. Der Wunderbar Bar, I love movies with a great start. A start that sets up the movie for the rest of the run, like the desert scene in Close Encounters or the prehistoric vista in 2001. What movie favorite of yours has such a beginning? Oh, there are so many, aren't there? Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark has a great beginning. Uh, Saving Private Ryan has that beginning that's better than the rest of the movie by like tenfold. It's just an amazing first act on Omaha Beach and the rest of the movie is just kind of like, oh, it's a pretty good war movie. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, there Will Be Blood has an awesome, awesome opening sequence. There are lots and lots of movies. Oh, J.J. Uh, uh, Abrams' Star Trek, that opening sequence of, of 2009's Star Trek with the birth of Captain Kirk and the death of his father on the ship. Uh, such a sad, beautiful scene. Really, really elevates that whole movie, I think. Uh, so, yeah, those are some examples for me. I, a very, very important. The beginning of a movie is very important.
The insane pumpkin carver, Steve, if you could time travel to any city at any historical time, like a time tourist or something, which one would you choose and why? I would travel to classical Athens in the time of Pericles or Burlington when Bernie Sanders was mayor. Wow. <laughs> Placing Bernie Sanders in some very august company. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, the, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is to go to uh, Alexandria, ancient Alexandria, before the library was destroyed, because you always hear about how incredible, you know, Alexandria, the most educated city in the ancient world, and wouldn't it have been something to be there uh, in its heyday before it was, uh, before the library was, was, was destroyed. But, you know, by today's standards, I don't know, maybe the Alexandrian library wouldn't have been that great. You know, maybe, you know, now that we're in the, the land of Google and Wikipedia and everybody has the world at their fingertips on their phone, maybe the library at Alexandria wouldn't be as impressive to our jaded, entitled, over-informed, modern uh, points of view. But I don't know. I, I, Alexandria would probably be the first uh, thing that came to mind. I mythos, is there anything that would make you consider becoming vegetarian or vegan? Actually, I have been vegetarian since about January. I didn't uh, decide, I didn't share it in a video. I think I might have mentioned it once or twice in passing, but I didn't make a big deal about it because I don't really think it is that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, I've been a vegetarian since January. I did cheat uh, at Easter. I did eat Easter dinner with my family and have some ham uh, and break my vegetarian uh, principles, but, but for the most part, I have been vegetarian for about five months now. Um, and I did it for a combination of uh, ethical and health reasons. Um, and I'm quite happy with it. I'm doing pretty good as a vegetarian. So far, so good. I'm still early going into it, but it's so far, so good. Uh, Michael Gray, assuming Trump loses in November, any other result is too frightening to consider, do you think the ensuing chaos will finally put an end to right-wing radio and Fox News? No, I, I think if Trump loses and uh, if that is seen as a repudiation of that far-right, ultra-conservative, you know, unapologetically racist, sexist, homophobic form of conservatism, uh, I think the anger at being rejected and losing uh, the election will will probably keep Fox News and right wing talk radio humming along for for quite a few years after that. Um, they might be pushed a little further out of the mainstream. They might go be be banished back to the the newsletters and the internet boards, and they won't have you know radio shows with millions and millions of, of uh, listeners. But I, they'll still be around. Those shows will still be around, and people will still be able to uh, command audiences doing that sort of thing. I don't think Trump losing will will destroy it at all. Uh, Jesper Lawman, what do you think will happen if Donald Trump gets elected as president? I agree with Michael. It is a result too frightening to consider. Actually, no, I, I don't think it would be the apocalypse that some of us fear that it would be, but it's not something that I look forward to at all. I think it would really, really destroy America's stature in the world. I think uh, whatever gains we may have gotten over the last eight years with uh, Obama as president would be lost very quickly. I think there, there are quite a few folks outside of the United States who consider it an embarrassment and an absurdity that a person like Donald Trump is even in a position where he could hypothetically win the presidency. Uh, so it would not do us any favors on the international stage. Um, and that to me is very important. And it, you know, I can't imagine the policies of a Trump presidency would do any good for people of color or women or people living in poverty or pretty much any disadvantaged group. So it would not be fun. <laughs> it would not be fun, but perhaps I'm too optimistic. I don't think it would be the end of the world. Uh, we've lived through terrible presidents before, um, but it wouldn't be fun. And it's not something I hope I have to live through. Kyle Butler, do you think the social justice community should try and claim the term social justice warrior for their own in much the same way as the gay community adopted the term queer? If it caught on, that would certainly stop SJW from being used as an insult, or is it just not a big enough problem to really spend the time and effort on? What do you think? I mean, to me, it's not that important. I don't waste any time trying to reappropriate the term. I actually like having the term social justice warrior or SJW uh, as a pejorative because it sort of acts as a tag to people. 
because I know if someone calls someone an SJW as an insult, that that person is probably a dick and not someone to be taken seriously or paid attention to. And I kind of like that. I kind of like having it as, as a marker for assholes. Uh, so I'm not eager to see it reclaimed. But I don't know, perhaps some of my fellow uh, quote-unquote SJWs feel differently. And if it happens, it happens. But I'm, I'm fine with it as it is. Uh, as, leave it as an insult and allow it to be used by pricks and dicks and, you know, small-minded, uh, ignorant people to identify themselves. It, it, let it be like a verbal Confederate flag. I'm fine with that. Hey, that's it for the questions. Before I get out of here, as always, I'm going to give a shout-out to someone who really deserves it. Last week, I gave a shout-out to a podcast, and I'm going to give a shout-out to a podcast this week, and it's the podcast of the San Antonio Clubhouse. This is a podcast that was just started... And it's hosted by a pal of mine, Rock and Rob, and it is the podcast of the San Antonio Clubhouse, which is a facility that is dedicated to helping people who struggle with uh, mental illness uh, recover and uh, be empowered and reach their potential and, and uh, find peace and, and stability in their lives. It's a really wonderful facility. It's a wonderful place. It's part of uh, a network of clubhouses that are similar to the San Antonio Clubhouse, stationed uh, all over the country. And uh, the San Antonio Clubhouse podcast was recently started by my pal Rock and Rob, who is the host. And it is not just an informational podcast about the San Antonio Clubhouse, although that is part of what the podcast does. It is also an outlet for people with uh, mental illness, people who live with mental illness, to speak out, to share their stories, to uh, both empower themselves and empower others who might, who might face similar struggles uh, listening to the podcast, and to talk about uh, mental illness and mental health just in general, and try to remove some of the stigma uh, that afflicts people who live with mental health issues um, and I think it's a really wonderful thing. And I listened to the first episode just recently. It's relatively short. It, the, the first episode was only about 20 minutes long, so it's not a great investment of your time. And it's a really, it's just a wonderful project. And I think it's a really good thing that, that Rob and the rest of the folks there at uh, the San Antonio Clubhouse are doing. So I highly recommend that you go and check out the uh, San Antonio Clubhouse podcast, and check out the San Antonio Clubhouse in general. There's a link in the description box to the SoundCloud page of the podcast and also to the website of the San Antonio Clubhouse itself. So I would recommend you go check out both of those because uh, the podcast is great and the San Antonio Clubhouse is a really, really wonderful resource for folks in the San Antonio area who have need of uh, the help that it offers. And it sounds like a really wonderful place. So very, very proud to give a shout out to Rock and Rob and the San Antonio Clubhouse podcast. I also want to give a shout out, as I always do, to another set of podcasts that are very near and dear to my heart. These are the Let Me Listen podcasts that are produced and hosted by my very good pal, Jason Harding. There are three podcasts in the Lemmy Listen family. There is Lemmy Finish, which Jason co-hosts with Finite Atticus, who is a damn fine fella himself. There is uh, American Monsters and How to Destroy Them, the really, really wonderful improv comedy podcast that you can listen to all the episodes of right now. The first season is complete and up there, and you can binge listen the whole thing. Um, and there is Late Seating, the movie review podcast hosted by yours truly and Jason Harding. We co-host together and we review uh, classic films, movies with a certain reputation, movies that are thought of as being peerless masterpieces or thought of as being just awful bombs that you should never watch for any reason. We watch both types of films, we give them a fresh review, and we decide if they deserve whatever reputation they have. And you can listen to all the episodes of Late Seating and all the episodes of all the Let Me Listen podcasts at lemmelistenpodcast.com. And I really, really, really hope that you do. That's it for me, everybody. Thank you all for watching. I want to remind you, as always, to please leave a comment on this video to ask me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video. So until then... Take care, everybody. One more thing before you go. 
I hope you enjoyed this video, folks. If you did, please like it and share it and subscribe to this channel if you're not subbed already. And also, please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.